Hi everyone, today I'm reviewing Saturnine by Dan Abnett. So this is book four in the Siege of Terror series, and it sees the defenders, led by Rogue or Dawn, having to decide where to prioritise their defences, as the walls and bastions start to fall. There's several gates to defend, but they cannot possibly hold them all. So there's some difficult decisions that have to be made. We see characters and forces from the previous book's feature, as well as some new introductions, such as humans fighting on the front line especially. Dan Abnett wrote the very first Warhammer books I've read, the Gaunt's Ghost series, and he's been chosen from a large cast of writers to write the very final book, which will be in two volumes titled The End and the Death. On the evidence of this book, he was a good choice. So, in terms of the pacing, it did feel slightly slow at first, but I do think this might be a bit pedantic. It wasn't as if Abnet spent too much time on particular characters or scene setting. I think there's just a lot to cover, so he kind of needs to have a bit of exposition. Descriptions of the scale of the throne world do have a good feeling, and it never delves over much into the imagery. Once the action develops, it rattles along at a great pace. Engagements feel frantic, holding the gates feels desperate as well, and the power of fan-favourite characters is displayed well for the most part. Dawn, the Khan, Zephon, the Mornival, and more all have interesting moments and fights. Camba Diaz organising the Imperial defences before the World Eaters hit, knowing that mainly with humans alongside him, they're not going to be able to hold the onslaught. And then his valiant duelling with them, never taking a backward step, really feeds the imagination. Valdor charging out, the Imperial troopers facing untold horrors, and the remembrances caught in the middle of all this chaos. It's very evocative. And I'm going to redact uh, some of the names here, but Redacted had put down World Eaters less berserk and Night Lords less energetic. Redacted was more tireless than Iron Warriors he had slain, more rapid than Emperor's children he had jeweled. It was blunt trauma like a salamander's warhammer, cold fury like an Iron Hand's mind, seething rage like a wolf of Fenris, zealous hatred like a bearer of words. It was the terror of the Shining Angels, it was the unknowability of their darker cousins, it was the invincibility of Ultramar, it was the swift death of deliverance, end quote. And I've obviously removed the names to avoid spoilers, but that was a really memorable passage for me where Abnet was obviously trying to reference a lot of the legions there. But it was done in quite a effective way, to my mind. And I think that's kind of reflective of the end of this book, where the kind of ending crescendo is really great. There's a good degree of build-up, and I think the action and the characters don't disappoint. So in terms of the actual story and plot, um, there is a bit more room to play with, slightly more. Uh, I think this is 465 pages in this large format hard uh, paperback, and there are many characters to cover. But I do think there's obviously variation. I think this is pretty common for these Horus Heresy books, where um, it... The plot and the characters are done to varying degrees of efficacy. You know, some do feel slightly unimaginative sometimes. And I think that is a bit of a symptom from reading so many books about, you know, Space Marines, etc. But then there are others that are done more effectively and they're a bit more engaging. As well as the Imperial Army troops, Remembrances feature heavily. Space Marines, Primarchs, and avoiding spoilers, we even encounter some characters from the earlier times of Terra. So there's a bit on the kind of provenance of, um, you know, the Emperor and some of the people around back then. Moving back to the current, though, I love the interplay between Ollie Piers and Hari Ha, the grizzled veteran soldier and essentially a historian uh, placed on a battlefield where basically he probably shouldn't really be at. He's not really equipped to deal with all the chaos around him. Sigismund and Dawn kind of developed the trend from the last few books and they're kind of almost outright hostile pretty much in this book. Um, 
I mean, I think it's a bit subjective and it is a trend that's been kind of progressed over several books, but they do really seem to not like each other at this stage. There was, um, to add to these interactions, um, Amon Taromachian, I probably butchered that pronunciation, the Custodes, had a, he's kind of like got the form of a detective in these books at the moment, and he's doing a lot of investigation exploration, and there's kind of a side uh, sort of plot or theme about discussion of the Emperor as a god, and I think it is implemented really naturally in the story, so it has a good place there. And um, it's examined through different plot strands too, so I quite liked how that was done. In terms of some of the characters, some of their deaths came thick and fast, maybe a little too fast for their provenance to be acknowledged. Um, and although it is difficult, I think there was one character who seemed to get killed off without much fanfare, uh, despite their prominence in the lore. And I think, obviously, this is quite an important note. With with Legion affiliations as they are, you know, a lot of people have a particular favourite Legion or whatnot. It's quite hard for writers to stay unbiased, but I did feel like in this book, the Emperor's Children were portrayed in a far less favourable light to other Legions. But then you could ask, well, is it fair to compromise the story to ensure every Legion gets equal treatment? Probably not. I mean, sometimes they're probably going to get a bit of a rough hand dealt. But I do think from reading a lot of Warhammer books that across the board, like the writers would be smart to vary their treatment of particular Legions by utilising different angles. So, you know, if a Legion keeps seeming to lose, perhaps they can show that it was kind of part of some wider plan or that you know, their intention wasn't actually necessarily to win the battle man for man, but they had some kind of deeper objective or it was a strategic withdrawal. But unfortunately, I tend to see that the writers either kind of like or dislike a legion. They'll kind of write them in a single way. And I did feel that was the case a bit with the Emperor's Children in this one. It would add much more depth. You know, they could make it deeper and multifaceted if they kind of approached different angles. Um, and that's not really a criticism of Abnet in particular. I think that this is just more of a generalist point where I think they would do well to either make sure one writer doesn't always write the same Legion, which I don't think they do, thinking about it, but they often have a particular writer set for a Legion for almost every book, usually. Um, although that does tend to change over time. There's some references in the story to Magnus's plan, uh, which is covered in the Siege of Terror novella, Fury of Magnus, which I'll review next. And that's not part of the numbered uh, Siege of Terror books. This is book four. But it fits well into the story before Mortis, uh, book five. So it's recommended to read Fury of Magnus before Mortis. Readability of this book. Slightly more so than other Horus Heresy and Siege of Terror books. There was some advanced language. There's some words I didn't know, you know, for someone who reads a lot. Um, and then obviously there's the all the usual Warhammer terminology. So on readability, probably slightly less readable than some other books in this series. But for the final score, you know, I think this is one of the best Siege of Terror books so far. Abnet's writing has a feeling of refinement that I, I didn't really get in some of the other books. And... You know, I think it's a real great read in terms of action towards the end of the book, especially. Having said that, it does feel like there's a lot of characters still and slight meandering in the early part of the book. But I think it was really overly compensated by the action, the tension, the drama later on. And the challenging struggle to hold the gates ensured the book didn't really slow down. So it's prob probably the strongest Siege of Terror book so far, giving it 8 out of 10. Uh, I think I gave Solar War 8 out of 10, if I remember correctly. So, but I think this one is actually the best so far. So, well worth a read. Uh, I'm excited for the rest of the books. Uh, like and subscribe to view all of those. I'll be reviewing them all in turn. Cheers.